Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to AEI. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar uh, with uh, AEI and what it is and what it does. Um, we are a public policy think tank um, and we are um, dedicated to defending human dignity, expanding human potential, and building a freer and safer world. And the mechanisms for doing that are um, democracy, free enterprise, and um, American strength um, at home and abroad. Um, so tonight, or this afternoon, I should say, you know, we're gathered here for a conversation about a conundrum. And that conundrum is that on the one hand, um, the combination of uh, an extended period of mostly good economic growth um, on the one hand, and the development of a robust public safety net um, have, have really delivered to us kind of the best of times in some ways. Um, it, if you measure this by consumption poverty, which is um, the measure of poverty based on how much families spend on um, food and housing, other goods and services, and, you take into, and it also takes into account the value of transfer payments uh, for shelter, health care, nutrition, and other benefits, um, consumption poverty in this country has dropped over 90% since 1964. Um, today, just 3% of Americans fall below the poverty line as measured by what they're able to consume. So poverty, as it's measured by material deprivation, has receded. And yet, poverty and the problems that it creates lives on. But the poverty we confront today is qualitatively different uh, than the poverty of the early 1960s. It's a poverty measured in declining workforce participation rates, rising levels of opioid addiction, fractured families, and high levels of non-marital births. It is measured in deaths from drug overdoses and declining civic participation. It is a poverty that's still found in our great urban centers, but is increasingly entrenched in small and medium-sized cities, towns, and rural areas across the country. In the face of these challenges, um, the federal programs and growth that did so much to reduce poverty over the last 50 years seem really quite impotent. We have, a new, pover we have new poverty challenges and they require new, new solutions. So our speaker this evening is um, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, uh, and he's here to help us think about some new perspectives on the state of our communities and um, the way it relates to uh, how we might think about alleviating uh, some of the conditions that we're confronted with. His new book, The Third Pillar, How Markets and the State Leave Communities Behind, uh, offers us a fresh analytical approach for thinking about our poverty challenges and potential solutions, and they're built on restoring the strength and authority of local communities. Um, at the conclusion of Dr. Rajan's um, presentation, we're going to be joined by AEI's Director of Economic Policy Studies, Michael Strain, and our visiting fellow, Tim Kearney, author of Alienated America, Why Some Places Thrive While Others Collapse. And we're going to engage in a dialogue with Dr. Rajan about his book. Dr. Rajan is the Catherine, Catherine Dusak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He was the governor of the Reserve Bank of India between 2013 and 16, and also served as vice chairman of the board of bank of the Bank of International Settlements between 2015 and 2016. Dr. Rajan was the chief economist and director of research at the International Monetary Fund between 2003 and 2006. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rajan. Thank you very much for having me uh, here today. Um, so what I want to do is uh, maybe walk you through a little bit of, uh, of why I wrote this book and uh, what I think the, the problems are. And uh, perhaps we can leave the, the solutions to some of the discussion we will have in the panel. So um, what I try and do in this book is try and explain why capitalism works so well uh, 
in the post-war years? What uh, led, uh, what, what kinds of forces came together in the liberal market democracies that we had? And, and often people, when they think of capitalism, think uh, it's primarily about markets, and it certainly is. Um, and sometimes there is a role for the government, uh, perhaps in enforcing contracts and property rights. But of course, we know that uh, in uh, successful market democracies uh, in the post-war years, governments do a lot more. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But what is often left out is the role played by the community. Uh, we know that people don't enter the markets when they're born. They're brought up in communities which nurture them, provide them capabilities, and so on. And of course, the communities are a support when, in fact, people uh, run out of room, um, for example, on their unemployment insurance. Uh, where did they go back to in Southern Europe? But uh, as the Great Recession went on, they went back to their communities. The communities provide uh, a variety of safety nets uh, over and above the capability building that they help in. And um, moreover, in many countries, they become a building block for democracy. Many uh, communities uh, are where uh, both uh, learning on how to participate in democracy, but also the possibility of uh, coalescing together in democratic protest. Uh, uh, the community makes that easier. The point uh, more generally is that the community is an essential building block of capitalism. And uh, it helps to keep capitalism working for the many. And when capitalism works for the many, there's uh, democratic support for capitalism. The many support capitalism. And somehow this is breaking down, as Brent said. Uh, somehow in the last few years, there is increasing despair. The aggregate numbers don't show it. We've got 3.7% unemployment in the country. By historic standards, this is wonderful. Inflation is below 2%. Historic standards, it's wonderful. Carter's misery index, the sum of unemployment and inflation, is really very low. And yet people are unhappy. And that, I think, has to do with the fact that we have many communities, uh, as, as Tim points out in his book, who are deeply distressed and deeply unhappy. And some of the unhappiness stems from that. And I would argue that it's bigger than that, it, that it, it actually can help. Uh, it, it, it is having an effect on the balance that uh, creates the liberal market society and uh, an effect that, if unaddressed, could be more problematic down the line. Let me uh, run quickly through some definitions that, uh, in the book, the state, which is one of the pillars of society, uh, that holds up society is, is what we normally think of the state. And, and typically, I want to associate this with the central government. Uh, it's the executive, the judiciary, the legislature. Amongst the things it does is uh, offer security and justice. This has historically been the role of the state. Um, but also, um, you know, when uh, um, it, it, uh, in the 19th century, uh, the state learned to contain itself and be constitutionally bound and allowed for freer markets, um, uh, people realized that uh, it wasn't easy to participate directly in markets. You needed some amount of education. Uh, initially, it was primary education. Then it became um, um, high school education. The state entered the, the uh, area of capability building. Uh, it helped people gain those capabilities. And as market volatility also started increasing, the state entered the area of providing safety nets. Uh, Bismarck's Germany, for example, one of the first European countries to provide a formal safety net, but then the UK, eventually the United States. Um, so that's the state. Uh, markets are what you think they are, basically uh, goods markets, labor markets, capital markets. Uh, essentially, their function is to enhance productivity in society. Uh, but also enhance innovation and choice. So all the usual things we think markets do. And, and finally, the third pillar, which is the community. Um, what I, uh, to fix ideas, I talk about the proximate community, the neighborhood, the village, the municipality, and I include within it, within it community institutions like schools, churches, uh, et cetera, but also uh, uh, the local government. 
Now, with that in mind, uh, I think the, uh, the question that many people have, especially in cos cosmopolitan cities, is does the community matter anymore? Do we care about the proximate community? And, and you know, having lived in neighborhoods where nobody knows their neighbor, uh, it is a very real question that, uh, that in fact, there are neighborhoods uh, which don't hang together anymore. But in much of the world, uh, communities still do matter. They do become a source of identity and values for people. Uh, they do fill in the holes left by uh, the formal contract with the state, the, the, the social contract, so to speak, as well as the explicit contracts with the market. Example again, when you run out of unemployment insurance, uh, when you run out of money, um, who's there to support you? Typically, it's the community filling in the holes left by the formal system. Uh, it's based on relationships, not on formal contracts or formal rights. It's based on who you are and, and who uh, takes, uh, takes a sense uh, of responsibility for you. And um, in addition to this, of course, I fo focus on the fact that often it's the building block of political organization. This is not to rule out other forms of community. We have many, many forms of community today, but think about my definition to fix ideas because it is the predominant form of community, even with virtual communities, even with, uh, with imagined communities such as the national community, this still is important, uh, and I'll come to that in a bit. So here is the, here is the model. Here's the model of why I think the system sort of works and how it hangs together. Uh, the blue arrows are things that I've already talked about. They are the connections between the three pillars, uh, the fact that the state uh, provides uh, sort of uh, uh, regulation, uh, antitrust, property rights, et cetera, to the markets, uh, the fact that it uh, provides capabilities to the community, and the fact that the markets provide productivity and choice to the community. The, what is less, uh, less uh, talked about are the other arrows. For example, uh, markets are extremely important in containing the power of the state. Um, an independent private sector typically is a large source of power which can limit the ability to the, of the state to be oppressive. We've seen this again and again, but even today look across the world uh, in the United States, uh, what, we had, uh, what we have in Washington today are a variety of structures which help contain the power of the administration. For example, you, know, you, have, uh, political, uh, you have press organizations like Bloomberg, like, uh, like the Washington Post, like the New York Times, which essentially make it their job to ferret out uh, problems uh, with what the administration is doing and therefore help contain it. In the previous administration, Fox News played a big part in trying to contain uh, the administration. These are independent organizations. Uh, look across the world, look at emerging markets with authoritarian uh, governments, and you will see an independent private sector simply doesn't exist. It's not independent because the state provides contracts, uh, advertising contracts, for example, the state determines a whole lot of regulations without any checks and balances. The state determines uh, effectively profitability for these entities. And when the state is in so much control over the private sector, uh, determining tariffs, determining a variety of, uh, of, uh, of regulations, uh, then there are no checks and balances on the state. So in other words, an independent private sector, independent market is very important for democracy to prevail. So that's number one. Second is the arrow from the community going to the state. Adam Smith complained about the tendency of large players in the private sector to get together with the government and form a crony capitalist state. Much of the wealth of nations is complaining about how big business gets together with big government, right? In Adam Smith's time, democracy was not a big force. But we've seen again and again Democracy is one antidote to crony capitalism. You've seen it in the United States. Every time the power of big business gets, uh, gets significantly worrying, democracy starts uh, uh, asking questions. We saw it in the 1890s when you had the first populist movement, uh, the, the farmers rising up against the big railroads and the big banks, essentially saying they are constraining us, they are charging monopoly prices, we want 
action against them, the first populist movement led to antitrust. The Sherman Antitrust Act was in many ways a consequence of the populist movement. The populist movement morphed into the progressive movement, which led to uh, you know, the creation of regulatory bodies like the Federal Reserve, like the F Food and Drug Administration, things like that. So democracy tends to ask questions. Today, democracy is asking, a que asking questions about big tech. How powerful should big tech be? What are the sources of competition to big tech? Is it adequately open uh, given these large platforms? And, and finally, uh, the community also serves as a source of values and norms. One of the interesting things if you look through history is how much values and, and norms have changed and how they drive um, you know, the beliefs in markets. But I'll, I'll leave that for the moment. So what are the big causes of imbalance? Well. Great Calamity, uh, the Great Depressions, the first one, uh, 1873 to 1893, the second one, of course, in the 30s that we all uh, know more familiarly, um, both those had enormous effects on uh, social structures. For example, you could argue that Bismarck's uh, um, sort of uh, changing the German system to bring in a variety of forms of social security was in many ways a response to the kind of economic hardship that was hitting uh, German workers. Uh, similarly, uh, what, what we saw in, in the 30s was social security uh, in the United States as a result of the deep calamity. And you can hear, you can see from Roosevelt's initial speeches that he had in mind a change in the social contract given the deep depression that was taking place. Um, today, uh, uh, a different kind of, uh, of force is hitting us. Again, a force which has repeatedly hit society, technological change. And that technological change is driven primarily by what we call the ICT revolution, the Information and Communications Technology Revolution. Let me walk through a few ways it has affected us. Well, clearly, the ICT revolution has made possible levels of trade, but also levels of uh, creating global supply chains that simply were not possible 20 years ago, or even, uh, um, um, uh, even 20 years ago. Uh, think, for example, uh, today, because of uh, really strong communications technology, you, <coughs> you can monitor what's happening in your Thai production plant on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. You know what's going on. You can intervene if, in fact, production is going off track. Um, you can also transport back and forth at relatively low prices, given the availability of, of, uh, of technological uh, sort of um, structures, like, like, for example, logistic chains uh, with uh, containers and so on. So what this all does is essentially reduce the cost of trade and reduce the cost of controlling global supply chains. Now, as soon as you have this, what does it do? It allows you to do any part of the manufacturing process wherever it is most efficient to do it. Often, this means that the service parts of the manufacturing process stay in industrial countries. The production part of the manufacturing process get taken to the emerging markets where labor is cheaper. Apple, as some of you know, produced its last product in the United States. Um, manufactured its last product in the United States in 2004. Um, the Apple uh, cell phone, uh, which costs $1,000 here, uh, $300 of that goes to Foxconn for manufacturing it. $700 stays here for the value added in, in the services. What does this do? Well, this ability to break up the process obviously enhances the market for service businesses here, especially those in R&D, design, et cetera, which are hard to replicate elsewhere. Uh, who does it affect? It affects manufacturing workers who have much more competition in the rest of the world. So what this kind of process, this globalization of trade, um, enhanced by technology, what it does is, of course, it means that manufacturing hubs in industrial countries uh, are much harder hit, especially those which are dependent on one big manufacturer in town, while the cities are flourishing. So some communities do very well, other communities do very poorly. That's a consequence of technological change. 
What this has also done is, uh, apart from hollowing out the middle income manufacturing jobs, increasingly automation is also hollowing out the middle income service jobs. Uh, this must be a time many of you are finishing off your taxes. Um, it used to be that you'd use an accountant. Uh, I certainly find it a pain getting all my things together for an accountant, so I download Tur TurboTax and do my taxes myself. Uh, what TurboTax has done is, is encapsulated all the knowledge that used to be in the accountant and put it in a program. And automation essentially enables me not to use the accountant anymore. And you see this happening again and again in service after service. Automation is killing the middle level service jobs. There is a job for the high priced tax lawyer who will tell you all the fiddles that one can do to reduce your tax bill, but the middle uh, who just helps you do your taxes because he or she knows the tax code, that job is, is vanishing. So um, most economists would say four out of five jobs that are lost are because of automation. One out of five is probably lost because of trade. But because trade is more concentrated in specific communities, that job loss is more visible and felt more strongly. So what we have is in the, level, in the structure of jobs, we have jobs at the low end, low skill jobs, jobs at the high end, a lot has vanished in between. But even within the high end, it's not just anybody with a degree gets a good job. Guys who have really good degrees and are really at the top of their profession make much more than the rest. Uh, what we have effectively are superstar professions. Lady on the left there, anybody recognize her? I don't think you will. She was the star of the London Opera in 1801. Uh, Elizabeth Billington used to fill the opera house, and uh, you know she was as successful as they get then. But she used to sing with full, uh, with a full house, but maybe in a season, a uh, hundred performances with a thousand people in the audience, give or take. That's a hundred thousand people she interacted with in a season. She made between 10 and 15 million pounds, uh, 15,000 pounds in the 1801 season, which would be about a million dollars today. The lady on the right is Taylor Swift. Um, diva, sings, uh, one of the most uh, well-paid. She made $170 million. Why does she make $170 million while uh, Elizabeth Billington makes only a million in today's money? Because Taylor Swift accesses a much larger audience. Even though they pay very little, each one, to, to reach her, uh, when you take the number of people who are willing to listen to her, she has a much bigger effective market. 5.5 billion downloads uh, of her latest song, while uh, you know, 100,000 in the audience for, uh, for Elizabeth Billington. The audiences for services uh, has grown so much uh, because we have worldwide markets. In these worldwide markets, Everybody wants essentially the, the best. Uh, the 10th best is no longer, uh, no longer cuts it. And that's the sense in which even within the well-paid, it's getting to be superstar professions. The best uh, lawyers, the best doctors get much better paid uh, than the middling ones. So I'll come to what this means in terms of uh, activity, but one of the things that happens with the globalization of markets is you get the globalization of governance. Now, this, is a const this has been a phenomenon that's going on for a long time. Most people think markets and governments are substitutes, that you have more markets, you have less government, you have more government, less markets. There's a sense in which they are, but they also complement, they grow together. And in fact, if you look at the rich countries in the world, they have much more of government than the poor countries. One of the reasons is markets require governance. And if you were in a small town uh, in the early part of the century, if you were in a small community, uh, the banks operated entirely within the town. They didn't operate outside. Capital requirements were set at the town level. Over time, banks went beyond the town to the state level. Capital requirements were set at the state level. They went beyond the state to the national level. Capital requirements were set at the national level. Today, they're multinational banks. Where are capital requirements set? In Basel. Of course, countries have to opine on it, but they're set behind closed doors by central bankers in Basel. So in other words, 
as markets have integrated, the desire for harmonization of markets and market regulation by market participants means governance keeps moving up. Within country, it used to move towards the capital. Now beyond the capital, it's going to the international level. And that prompts a lot of heartburn amongst people because they feel they no longer have democratic control. What's the big cry of the Brexiteers? It is, we want to take back control. It's not just about immigration. It's also about regulation. Too much of regulation they feel today is coming down from Brussels. It's not something they have any control over. Interestingly, this is what the conservatives in London say, but there are a lot of people outside London who say London has got too much control over us. We want to take back control to the regions because London has appropriated many of our powers. The broader point I want to make is as markets integrate, power migrates, and it's migrated from the community up to the national, to the international level. Uh, last couple of points. Um, so there are two ways the community has been affected that I've already uh, uh, talked about. One is the broader disempowerment of the community as markets and the state do more of what the community used to do, but also a disempowerment as government takes up more functions away from the community. So that's, that's one. The second is the very disparate effects of technology and globalization on communities. Some communities have been very badly hurt, and those hurt communities sort of have a double whammy. They were weak to begin with because they had very few functions, but further hurt by the fact that economic activity has disappeared. And as economic activity disappears, social dysfunction sets in, such as the opioid epidemic and the, the broken families. But there's a third factor going on also, which is as the returns to skills, the returns to education increases, uh, if you look at the private incentive, it is, I want the best deal for my kids. Where can my kids really get that best education? Because education has become so important. Well, it certainly is not going to be in, in poor communities where they go to school with other poor kids who've not had the benefit of being brought up in professional families where you hear a lot of words before you grow up, in families where you, know, you get really good nutrition, you get uh, sound values and habits. Uh, if you want the best education for your kids, you want to move them to a school where they're surrounded by kids who have been really well prepared by their families for getting a good education. My colleague at the University of Chicago, Jim Heckman, who's a Nobel laureate, says by age five, it's very hard to change the future of a child because they've already got the upbringing, the values, the, uh, the nutrition uh, that will set them for life. But if you are a parent and you want your kid to have the best education, you want to move them to a school where many more of these kids have that background and therefore will not hold back the class, the class will really do, do really well. So what you see is increasingly because of market pressures, there is pressure on parents to move to the districts where schools will be really good. In today's America, it means the richest district that I can afford. Either take my kids to private school or go to the richest district I can afford because that's where the public school is going to be the best. And what you see increasingly is this process that communities that used to be much more integrated are breaking apart. And this is a process that is continuing over the last 20 years. It's not just a you know, white flight from the movement of African Americans into communities, but this is something that's continuing. And it is happening because of parents, because you see the people who move are the people who have kids. They're moving to the richest community they can afford. If everybody does that, you get the middle community breaking down into rich communities and poor communities and fewer in the middle. And that's what you see in the data. That's what's been happening. Now, if this is happening, of course, the people left behind, the guys who can't follow the ones who have moved into the rich communities because of unaffordable local uh, real estate prices, they're going to be really angry because they don't have the same opportunities given the kinds of schools, et cetera, that they have access to. This is a phenomenon in some way or the other is, is there in almost every industrial country except the ones that truly have continuing mixed communities. And that's something we can talk about later. So uh, essentially, 
What this creates is widespread anger, and I'll stop here. Widespread anger, uh, there is a popular movement against this. And of course, the elite are, are, are uh, you know, seen as part of the problem. The elite have distanced themselves from the larger masses, and, and certainly they represent part of, uh, of the problem that the, uh, the populace see. They've cornered the goodies both in terms of access to opportunity by cornering uh, education and the latest scandal on people getting their kids into Ivy League by bribing appropriately is, is just the tip of the iceberg. Even before that, just the way the system is structured means very different opportunities to do well. And, um, and so the populists are angry. But in a sense, their answers are the wrong answers. Their answers are, let's get rid of the system of, uh, of open trade. Uh, let's get rid of immigration. And, and somehow, things will be fine again. And the reality is, uh, as important as uh, trade might be in, in creating these problems, it's also beneficial. Uh, moreover, you know, much of the problem stems from technological change. Job losses are because of technological change. If you don't change the capabilities people have, they still will not be able to cope with the job losses that are coming. Uh, moreover, as populations are aging, we already have huge unfunded entitlements in many industrial countries. How will this, these be paid for if, in fact, the pyramid of uh, the aging population that sits on the workforce just keeps growing? You need workforce expansion. If people stop having children, you need more people coming in. One of, the, one of the bigger problems in America is the loss of people from communities, shrinking communities, rather than the fact that we have no space. Obviously, we want controlled immigration, but putting a stop to immigration is going to be problematic for every industrial country. Um, and moreover, uh, on this issue of let's stop trade, let's stop immigration, well, think about uh, as populations age, where are the markets? The markets are not going to be domestic. We've seen from the experience of Japan that as populations age, the country becomes much more reliant on external markets. Japan grows every time its exports grow. Where are go the external markets for the country going to be going forward? They're going to be in the young countries of the world. Young countries are the emerging markets, are the developing countries in Africa and the Middle East. If you put barriers to them today, those barriers are still going to stay when we need those markets. And finally, of course, we've seen that the problems which require global answers, such as climate change, are hitting us today. And it's very hard to negotiate with somebody if you've just put 25% tariffs on them. So for global solutions, we actually need uh, to continue keeping the world global uh, and open. And how do we do that and yet address the problems of failing communities which desperately need some revitalizing? That really is, is setting up the, the question in the book. And uh, I, I think uh, the bottom line I want to argue is you can't take pieces and, uh, and solve it. Uh, you need to think about the whole equilibrium. How do we ensure that we keep a balance? So for example, some people say we should go to socialism. Let's get socialism, that'll fix all the problems. Well, one of the points I emphasize is the role of democracy in, uh, uh, and, and, and the role of private markets in keeping democracy alive. Uh, I would ask anybody who advocates socialism, name one socialist country that is democratic. Uh, you may say Sweden, but Sweden is not really socialist. It has a very vibrant private sector. It's very hard to find a socialist country. In fact, I think at this point there are zero that is also democratic. That's where the balance comes in. You need all the pieces to hang together, and that's why uh, my solution, which I'll explain if I ever get the chance, is uh, at the uh, international uh, level, or at the national level, responsible sovereignty, combined with civic nationalism in how communities are treated, and finally, inclusive localism. But we'll get a chance to talk about all that. So thank you very much. That's uh, the easy part, talking about the problems. The harder part is talking about solutions, which I think we'll come to. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much for the remarks and the good um, introduction to the problem. And I do think it would be good if we spent some time on solutions. Um, I think before we do that, I want to make sure that our respondents, um, Mike and Tim, have a chance to kind of uh, react a little bit to what they've heard, um, talk about some of the things where they see alignments between their perspectives on some of these problems, as well as some uh, areas of difference, um, which I think we might be able to call out. So I'm going to start with Tim and have him reply. Please go ahead. Yep. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thanks for writing this book. And I, I think it's really important to make the point uh, to emphasize that these three things, community, states, and markets, provide checks on each other. Because so much, so many times in Washington and political circles, people just talk about the, the state and the market or government and business as checks on each other. Obviously, as you point out, a lot of times they work hand in hand um, and that they leave behind the community. And so a lot of the populist reaction, you see a lot of uh, conservative populists today in the Trump era running to, um, well, maybe we do need more big government, whether to protect manufacturing or to stop the, the cultural changes they don't like. And f when you read your book, I think you come away saying, no, you know what, community can provide a lot of those checks, whether it's preservation of, of cultural goods or whether it's um, preservation of human capital, community can provide a lot of those things. So I think those are very important points. Um, what I, uh, and they, the other thing is the interesting blend between the very local community and the nationalism. Something that's really interesting about America is that patriotism often manifests itself on a very local level. It's like, what's patriotic? You ask somebody, especially someone, uh, you know, a, a baby boomer, and they say, oh, well, I remember on uh, Memorial Day planting flags in our, in our local cemetery. I remember the, the 4th of July parade and our, our, while our, our current president is talking about a giant massive thing on the mall and wants everybody watching it. That's not the way we celebrate independence Say here. Our nationalism manifests itself on a very local level, showing that while there is this, uh, self -re this regulating of these three, um, they, they work together well when they're in balance. That's why I think it's really important so that people stop seeing state versus uh, markets or business versus government, um, but rather that there's a balance that community, this third uh, factor, this third pillar has to be in there. I think it's incredibly important, so thank you. Um, my, is it my turn? Yes, your turn. Uh, uh, so I think this is a, a very important book um, that that actually fills, in some way, fills a void in the in the conversation that we've all been engaged in for a few years now about uh, what has happened to to politics and 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 what has happened to societies following the Great Recession and and and, and the populist upswing. Much of the work has focused on. Much of the existing work is focused on examining what, what you might describe as pockets of problems. You know, uh, the opioid crisis, uh, the Rust Belt, um, you know, prime age men who aren't working. Uh, you know, these, these these sorts of these sorts of of of, of groups of people or, or places, uh, concrete places that are may have been left behind or that that are experiencing challenges. Um, this book is, attempts something that is in many ways much more ambitious than that. It attempts to provide a kind of a systematic uh, uh, understanding of, of how markets and community and the state interact with each other um, and, and how those interactions and the balance between them uh, has led to the current moment where we are in. The implication of that approach is that we don't just have pockets of problems. We have broad, structural, systematic challenges. Um, and so in many ways, that's much, much more depressing uh, and, and makes solutions much, much more difficult. Um, but it also may uh, eventually be more constructive and more helpful if indeed the problems are much deeper than, than uh, you know, the fact that the factory left town or that uh, there's been um, uh, overprescription of opioids. When I listened to the presentation and, and, and reviewed the book, I wanted to go 
my first thought, my, 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 big, my big reaction was, I want to go even deeper uh, into uh, this issue than, than the book does. Um, if you believe that people make choices based on their self-interest, uh, that people broadly do things because, because the choices they make will make them better off, then why isn't the decline of community a good thing? Uh, why isn't the decline uh, of community a natural thing? Uh, do we care about proximate community, which is, is the argument of the book, or do we care about community? I've spent, I've, I've been, I knew I was doing this this evening, and, and it's been on my mind all day, and, and I've been thinking today about, about community, and I've been thinking about the text messages that I'm getting, the emails that I've been sending, the Facebook and Twitter messages that I've been receiving, and it occurs to me that I am just awash in community. Um, people who I have met in my professional life, people who I met when I was at school, people who I'm related to, but none of these people, not one of the people I'm referring to, live within two miles of my house. Um, so do we care about community or do we care about proximate community? And if proximate community really is what matters, why? Uh, when I think about the great diagram that we saw that, that shows how markets and how the state and how community reinforce each other, I wonder if we replace the word community with the word individual. Are any of the other things uh, not true? Do individuals provide values and norms to markets? Do individuals provide uh, 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 oversight to democracies? in a way that communities don't. What, what is it about, about those functions that, requ that requires community rather than individuals? Um, if community provides oversight to democracy, then how are we in this situation uh, if we believe that, that the democratic system is producing systematically bad outcomes, at least in, in, in Western democracies uh, over the past few years? Uh, you know, isn't that prima facie evidence against the hypothesis? Um, so uh, I'll stop there. Um, uh, but that that is my that's my big reaction is 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 wanting to know more and and uh, understand some of the assumptions that this work seems to be rested upon. I'd like to give you a chance to sure. uh, uh, respond. First, to both. thanks for those very useful comments, and, and I think they they were uh, they were really r really good. Um, I, I like the point that patriotism is is local. I mean, I uh, I, I I mean that that didn't uh, once you say it, it's it's so obvious that uh, you. I mean, think about the the soldier going all over the trench, right uh, over the top. Uh, and the question in the First World War always was, why are they going over the top? And there's some notion of grand ideals that they were, no, they were going over the top because they don't want to be seen as cowards by their, their, the guys around them. And uh, that's why, I mean, you could say that, yeah, they also feared being shot, but that was only later when there was mass desertions that, uh, that they were taken out and shot. But really, it was, it was the fear of, of letting your comrades down. And that's, that's an example of, yep. of community to some extent. Um, so, uh, I think to Michael's question, why isn't the decline, so, so first, where is the individual in that, that the individual is act, actually at the center, uh, not in the community, but these are the structures that surround the individual and help them participate in society, so the individual is at the center. Um, now, I mean, self-interest, as we know, because of collective action problems, can actually result in an outcome that everybody dislikes, right? I mean. A classic example is Amazon and your local bookstore. You love the local bookstore because you can read a whole bunch of things in there and know what to get, but then it's costlier than Amazon. You pay close to full price, Amazon gives you 30% off. And so you'd rather, I mean, if you were self-interested, you go in there and 
look at the titles you want and go out and uh, and order from Amazon. But then that results in the local bookstore closing down. That's what that's what people with PhDs in economics do. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> they're yeah, bad people. Pe people with PhDs in economics are often are taught self-interest a little more uh, forcefully than and than. And by the elsewhere. way, you make the New York Times bestseller list if they actually buy it in the bookstore. So don't advocate your readers to do the Amazon. Thing. Well, that's good to know. Uh, so so the the point uh, uh, more broadly however, is that there is uh, self-interest can be self-defeating also if it, uh, if it results in community resources um, uh, sort of disappearing. Now, I, you know, I, I picked pick the proximate community just because that's the typical community that most people uh, still, in, if you aggregate people across the world, I think that's still the most obvious form of community. But you, you do uh, make a, a great point when you talk about effectively you're in the midst of a virtual community. And, and I would argue yes, but it still is the case that in many of these, not, not all, but many of these virtual relationships are lighter, less engaged. Uh, I would argue, and that's the point the book makes, that today we have the possibility of virtual overlaid on the real. And that often is really strong. Uh, my kids are in much better touch with their, their classmates through Facebook and all the other social media than we were because we had to call each time and you hit one person at a time. You couldn't just update your status uh, on Facebook and let everybody know that you were in town or, or that you had stopped being married. Um, the, um, the, the point is that these things have, uh, uh, I, I think, can work with each other. But I would think that most people still crave for, for, for a sense of community. I was at, at a hospital the other day, and I think the most depressing sight is to see an elderly person without any help. Uh, even though there are nurses and so on floating around, somebody who can't actually look for themselves, but at that point are dependent on somebody having a sense of tie. And if there's nobody around, that's really depressing. We're all headed in that direction, depressing as it may seem. We, uh, in aging societies, the degree of loneliness, people who don't actually talk to somebody during the day is increasing. So I would say, you know, great thing to have the virtual community to be able to connect. But going forward, it seems to me we have to rediscover the real community, the proximate community, because we will still be dependent on, uh, on people. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, I think great point on why communities haven't reacted before. And I would say it's, it's, it's the point that Tim makes in his book and that I, I try and make, which is you have differing effects. Uh, surrounded in Washington by a mega city, it's very hard to see that the heartland is actually broken. It's when you make that trip through, uh, through Illinois or uh, you know, many other places in this country that you see there's dead town after dead town. And I would say Brexit was a reaction of Northern England to London saying, look, we also exist, and we don't like the way things are going. And I would argue that uh, Mr. Trump's election was similarly a wake-up call. We also exist. Please take our problems into account. I think some of those people voted for Mr. Obama when he came in with the hope and change. But they didn't get that change, so they looked for another voice who, which would get them the change. Tim, did you want to say anything about um, Mike's question? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think you can be even stronger in saying the, the crucial, the, the necessity of the, of the proximate community. Um, and it's, it's something our, our boss, Arthur Brooks, talks about, the importance of us being in the same building at AEI and bumping into each other. The serendipitous... Arthur's and, never in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur is speaking a lot around the country because people want him there physically in the room with them. Um, that, that you do need the proximate community. As I mean, my, my wife and I, we constantly need and rely on neighbors and we, we lament that when we move to a different neighborhood where our next door neighbors aren't as tight. The people who have these things value them immensely and why do people pay so much money to live in the Washington DC area or to live in the right neighborhood of Brooklyn or that sort of thing. I mean the market is showing us very clearly that physically living in a certain place is incredibly important. There's talk during, oh well the internet, now everybody can work remotely. 
and the idea that it would be just as easy to have a great job in Kansas as it would be in a place like New York. Or, or the right neighborhood in New York, or the right neighborhood in DC, in Maryland, in Virginia. And so I think the market has shown us that people really do value and benefit from proximate community. And that's on sort of a, a market level. And then on the individual human level, the, the studies, the Raj Chetty studies about the upward mobility, it showed that these things are very local, that where you live, not sort of what your Facebook network is, but where you live has causal impacts on how well your children do. So I think you can sell that even harder, is to say the proximate physical communities um, are only partly replaced by digital communities. And in, the other thing I would say I, that I was least convinced about in your book was when you said technology, thing about, in, uh, about social media, about smartphones, about cable news, you said you think it's a, a net positive on community cohesion. I think in the long run it could be, and in some cases it is, but I think that the way it's heightened political rancor, the way that it draws people away from being present, especially when you look at teenagers on their smartphones, you look at me when I'm like in the backyard with my kids and suddenly I'll just quickly check my email. Next thing I know I'm totally ignoring my kids, your neighbors, etc. I think that at the moment we've had a net negative impact on community cohesion by the, uh, the recent technology. And I, if you've got a counter argument, I'll... No, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a counter argument, just very quickly. I mean, I, I, I can see how it detracts and we all have that, that experience. I do think over time we'll learn to manage it. In the same way as, you know, uh, we used to spend hours in front of the television. Mm -hmm. Now, I presume we spend less. Maybe it's because we spend more time on, on, on this. Uh, <laughs> What, what uh, a recent study by Eric, Eric Hurst, which, who looks at these kids who've been drawn into, into uh, the internet uh, and playing video games uh, mm -hmm. on these massive multiplayer games that you can play, uh, does find that these guys spend a lot of time on it and does take away from certain activities. But you know they see, still seem to find a fair amount of time for social activities. So I, I, I think, it can be played, which I, I can see the tendency, but I, I think also we will have a reaction where people will say, okay, I'm going to just junk my cell phone and not mm -hmm. look at it for a few days because and I want to de- That seems to have already happened, at least among the tech, among the elite. tech elite, you yeah. know, saying, you know, trying to restrict their own children from accessing this. I think that kind of stuff does trickle down uh, into the rest of society eventually. Um, so. I had a, the big question on my mind um, when I read your book was, uh, it feels to me like there's just this implicit contradiction between the ideas of inclusive and localism. That, and that national populism in this moment um, seems to explicitly reject you know, these free flows of people and capital and ideas uh, and culture that you, you say are necessary really to have uh, in communities work, you have to have both. You can't have just community. You've got to have um, this this free flow. Am I misreading that? What's the no? So so let me try and square the circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, first, I mean, I uh, so we're saying that uh, strengthening the community is a good thing, because when you say strengthen the community, people have in mind, oh, so you want to go back to segregated uh, communities where, where you know, uh, it's very parochial, uh, narrow, a narrowness of ideas, and narrow, you know, uh, not in invented here uh, uh, kind of mentality there, and of course not born here, so you're not part of it. And of course, ideally, that's not what we want to go back to. I mean, we, we think there is some value from uh, the flow uh, of new ideas, new thoughts. But we don't want to force it. So how can, we, how can we create it? Well, I would say rather than force integration, mm -hmm. uh, force the no discrimination. That's what you can do. You can apply the laws of the land and say you can't actively discriminate. But if you want to live together with people who look like you, who talk like you, who um, you know, have the same culture, by all means, be, uh, be free to do that. Uh, so long as you don't actively practice discrimination, people may stay away. They say, I don't want to be part of that group because 
that's that's alien to me but that becomes a vehicle for some people to express their their sense of identity and to perpetuate that it seems to me it's far less dangerous to have that done at the community level maybe beneficial in in cultural mm -hmm. continuity uh, rather than have it at the national level imposed on people who don't don't actually believe in that that level of con continuity so that's why at the uh, national level i'd rather have a civic nationalism where you know as in america we we are part of the country if we subscribe to the values of the country not based on uh, you know what your col the color of your skin or or your religion is but that said uh, what inclusive localism allows for is all kinds of communities very very uh, sort of uh, look-alike communities and very integrated communities. Uh, so is this a contradiction? And yes, because there is a sense in which I say more community empowerment, except the powers that allow you to exclude. So that would be constrained by national laws against discrimination, but also one place where, which is often used for excluding is zoning laws. Uh, if I require that every house in this community be two acres in size at least, I'm immediately saying there's a whole bunch of people who can't come in. If I say no multifamily homes, immediately saying a bunch of people can't come in. That, I think, is problematic for an integrated country. And so that is one place where I would go a little lighter on local powers. Now, is this a contradiction? Yes, but it, the US has lived with it, with it for a long time. At the state level, states have a lot of power to determine the laws within the state, except they cannot exclude commerce from other states or people from other states. That's the Commerce Clause in the US Constitution. Congress will make laws on those things which govern trade across states, but states can determine a whole lot of things, including minimum wages, uh, emissions, this, that. Uh, local regulation can be determined by the state. That's, that's the sense in which I think both can coexist. Certain powers to discriminate or exclude are not in your purview, but everything else. You can determine whether you have big box retailers or small mom and pop stores. That's, that's perfectly fine in, in your purview. I think that tension, though, between the inclusion and the local uh, the, is, is very important. And it's tricky because a lot of the American sort of self-image nowadays. The other day I was watching a segment on Fox where these, uh, the hosts were lamenting how much residual ethnic identity was left in America. It's like, well, I, you know, I'm Norwegian, but I just think of myself as American and it would be even better off if we all abandoned our other identities beyond Americanness. Now, I think this is a, an artifact of the very specific political times we're in, but when, when I read your book, when I was writing my book, I was saying, you know what, there's something to be said for the Italian Catholic parish next door to, and you used a phrase of sort of side by side, next door to, I mean, in Pittsburgh has this, Squirrel Hill, the, the Jewish parish built around a synagogue, the Jewish neighborhood built around a synagogue next door to a hipster neighborhood that has no religious identity or anything like that, but maybe probably they all went to college and, you know, whatever. They all wear skinny jeans or whatever their <laughs> uh, unifying principle is. And it's tricky because we're talking about people need to belong to a tribe. People need to have an us. Tribalism, though, is a bad word, and an us implies a them. So it's a, it's a, a very difficult thing, especially because our country has a history of segregation that was meant by white people to keep down black people. And so you start talking this way, and it's, it's incredibly difficult. I'm glad that you, that you touch on it, but it's going to have to be something we're gonna talk about because people do need tribes, they do need communities, but communities have to be able to define themselves, and yeah, some of that's gonna look like exclusion. Implies, it, it requires a boundary. There yeah. has to be something that defines where the community starts and stops. Right. So, so, so I, I talk about low walls rather than high walls. And, and you yeah. know, some of this could be a low wall. Yes, we all uh, have a common sense of church or common sense of temple yeah. uh, um, or synagogue. And, uh, but, but again, it, it's not meant to keep out anybody else. Now, the Pilsen community I talk about in, in, in the book is, is one such. I mean, it's, it used to be Eastern European. It's uh, changed around. Lots of Hispanic Americans in there. But now, you know, uh, 
so non-Hispanic whites are moving in. Uh, in fact, the other day, one of the kids, uh, one of the students from the university who was there, uh, came to me and uh, with a great sense of guilt, uh, am I sort of displacing, am I gentrifying the neighborhood? Am I displacing somebody there? Should I be moving in? And I said, look, that's, it, it's good because, uh, I mean, your help, obviously they'll have to look to people who are being priced out and uh, the community will have to figure out. And if you want to work on something, that's something you should work on, uh, on keeping uh, people in the community would otherwise be priced out. But in general, it's elevating economic standards in the community and that, that also lifts other people. So it's not a bad thing. But that's a community which is getting mixed again mm -hmm. uh, after going uh, to one, uh, one extreme. Michael, did you? I wonder if, if, so I like low walls other than high walls, um, but aren't low walls kind of how we got to this place? Uh, didn't low walls create the, the problem in some sense? You know, if, if a major problem, for example, uh, as you mentioned in the presentation, is kind of increasing residential segregation, um, by which I mean, you know, communities where the income distribution is, is more narrow. Um, uh, people with like income live with people with like income. People in kind of a like social station live with people on a like social station. That's a low wall problem, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of people point to that as, as a major uh, issue in U.S. society. Um, uh, at least half the people on this stage. Um, including Tim. <laughs> Tim's the other one of the two. Uh, and I wonder, I wonder if, I mean, do we need to be more bold? And so, first of all, is it is that not a low wall problem? Am, am I mis, misunderstanding? Um, and if it is a low wall problem, is it is it just not solvable? It, it is a low wall problem. It's basically people choosing, and the ability to move in and in and out of a community. In this case, out. Uh, effectively leaves the rest behind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that is a low wall problem. You're absolutely right. Now the question is, uh, do you solve it by building walls up or do you solve it in other, other ways? Mm -hmm. So the question is, and, and that's, I, I told you that some people sort of feel angry because the solutions are at the margin rather than, you know. So the radical way would be a couple of ways. Singapore mandates integration because it controls most of the housing it basically puts the Malay origin along with the, the Chinese origin, along with the Indian origin, uh, and different uh, sort of income groups, all, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty careful process of integration, but it's mandated. Uh, that, that would be one extreme. And of course, in, you, you can have congestion taxes on people. You live in an all something neighborhood uh, with a certain income level, and you get taxed more. That would be radical. Uh, what about at the margin? Can we do some things which allow for more integration? One example is the Texas uh, system, whereby if you're in the top three in any school, you get a position in the university. Now, I think that's not enough. You need, for the schools that are of lower quality, you need remedial education. But this does create the incentive for people to send their kids to the not so good schools because they know that they can still get a and, and allows, this is actually done in a, in a, in a similar way in Chicago. The elite schools, uh, the magnet schools, the Walter Payton, uh, et cetera, schools, uh, it's not based only on, on an entrance exam and merit, but they also have an intake of kids from all the feeder schools, a certain proportion from every school. And that allows people to then stay back saying, okay, uh, I don't have to run away. So it's increased, uh, not so much increased the wall, but increased the incentive to move the other way into the underperforming areas because you have a better chance of doing well. That's an example of uh, at the margin changing things a little bit so that people have more incentive. One of the things I've seen in Zambia is that uh, uh, you, know, uh, you want community workers to stay. They're really happy to stay in their own community, but they don't want to be stuck there. They don't want to be... So what they created was a national service of health workers, community health workers. So you have the pride of being part of the national service, but you were allocated back to your community. You had the option of leaving if, if it was really bad, but typically you went back there and you were perfectly happy staying. You had an exit option. You never exercised it. Well, I want to give 
an opportunity for our audience to ask a couple questions before we wrap up. Uh, and all those hands shot up um, at exactly the same time. Um, so we'll start um, with you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, well, and we've got mics coming in. Please uh, tell, Thank you very much. Uh, tell, uh, tell us your name. Uh, my name is George Mihais. And make sure, you, make sure you phrase this as a question. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, so thank you very much, first of all, because I think your book it was a must, not only in America, but around the world. It happened that since 2000, I'm involved with UNESCO when we launched what is called Intangible Cultural Heritage. So we had to apply for local development in Norway, in Sweden, in Switzerland, in Japan, and France. So there are as many policies as countries, the relationship, government, local community, and this accumulated values, intangible values of those local communities. And all those countries started recently, France last year, what is called how to build local communities, Egalité des Territoires, one of the most important policies. In Japan, they started what is called Cool Japan. Okay. Probably do, Japan do a, is the most advanced Let's, or long. My question is yes, the following. Thank you. How would you move from this framework you have, a template, to address specific situation in local communities in America? And how do, because what you said is a general principle, vital, indispensable. How would you move? It's, a, it's different, yeah. I mean. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I would put it as, as, as uh, five things at least. Uh, I'm sure Tim has, has, has uh, many more. Uh, people. You need to get people to, good people to stay, not leave. So how, and you need good people who've left to come back. So how do we get people back into the communities they, they came from so they, they, uh, they can build? Uh, sometimes the attraction is is power. If you have a powerless community, there's no incentive to stay. What what can you do, really? So, pushing power back that's that's part of this this sort of broader agenda. Uh, uh, what you need also is community engagement. What what are the th so I, I think these are all related. Is there something we can wrap ourselves around, which will make a difference? In the book, I talk about cleaning up indoor, which has uh, got people engaged. But that engagement then builds on, it, uh, on itself. So uh, engagement is important. Uh, often people ask, what can the government do? Because they want a government to take action. I think in many of these cases, it is like international development. It starts from within and is not forced from without. But what the government can do sometimes is provide support. Uh, money is always welcome in many of these places. But I don't think that should be the lead. It should be when you know what you want to do, that money sort of starts coming in. And of course, there is the, uh, 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 you know, the things that government can al always do, which is provide public goods. Infrastructure, for example, simply in some of these more remote communities doesn't exist. Connecting them to the national economy, connecting them to the international economy. I think community development in many ways looks like the development of poor countries except it's in some ways easier because you are living in a rich country. So really it's about how do you connect up the poor community, the, the community that's not doing well, to the national economy. And, and I think that's an easier problem to solve than how do we restart development. But you know, it has its own challenges and there are some different challenges. But I, I think it, thinking about it, that way might be easier. Okay, we have another question over here. <coughs> Hi, I'm Wells King with the Social Capital Project. Uh, I have a question about the model that you laid out, <clears throat> um, where what the values that, or, or the value that community provides to society, it's pretty intangible. Things like values and norms and oversight from democracy, but there's nothing really material that it provides, whereas what markets and government provide are actually quite material, like goods and services or the safety net in education. What policies would you, su would you suggest to actually create the, or at least to increase uh, the, the material benefits of community, so uh, as to like entice people to actually participate? So that's, that's a great question. Actually, it's more my oversight than, uh, remember when I talked in the first two slides, I said it fills in the holes. So these are the formal structures. It used to be, as I talk in the book, the community used to provide the safety net. Uh, pa parish level safety nets used to be the safety net in industrial countries. Then the government started providing more of it. 
So the community has moved there to filling in the holes, the stuff, stuff that's left behind when, when the government doesn't cover it or the markets don't cover it. For example, uh, we have so many instances of communities in the United States during the Great Recession putting together food banks through their schools for people who ran out of, ran out of food, clothing banks for those people. That's an example of communities filling in holes. But I, I would argue that also at the early childhood level, the, when neither markets nor government is present, communities are, are what give a sense of, uh, of, uh, of purpose, of, uh, of capability building for, for the young child. And that may be a lot of what, uh, what uh, uh, Raj Chetty finds, that, uh, that it's in the early years, uh, you know, going into, uh, into age 20, that of development that the community helps a lot in molding the child. So I, I think it still has functions, but you're absolutely right that those functions have, have been taken away to some extent. So I argue that perhaps at the margin, again, we can build up some of those functions. For example, uh, one of the reasons we don't expand social security is because we fear it will go to the undeserving other. Is there a way of bringing the community back into this, which it used to do historically? That is, uh, for deserving, quote unquote, deserving cases, that in fact there's an additional safety net over and above what is there, formalize that process, get people back uh, into the workforce by having the community take, take responsibility for them. That becomes a source of community engagement, but also provides an additional layer of safety net over and above what we have. I mean, those are ideas worth thinking about. At the margin, can we expand some of the community's role? Tim Again, I want to get a little more uh, uh, revolutionary than that. I think the community ought to be the first layer, the safety net, before both government and, and markets. In other words, you turn to Uber or a taxi cab to get a ride when you can't get a ride with your neighbor. You turn to, um, the, the federal government is needed to provide a safety net because some states are much richer than others and because it can be counter-cyclical in the times of a downturn, but that can be the federal government acting as a safety net of safety nets. So I think you are accurately describing the way things are in much of America. Though I'd say in a lot of elite neighborhoods where you know, you've got all the college educated people, they do live together in strong community. And for them, a lot of times, their safety net, I mean, for me, when my daughter was in the hospital, the, the preface to Alienated America, we, before we turned to, any, we never had to turn to anything else because we just got this flood of food, everything taking care of us. Um, if things got a lot worse, we would have been relying on, on Medicaid or something like that. But the, the first layer for a lot of elite communities is strong community. It should be that for more of the country, let government and the markets be the next layer. Um, okay. am, I am I allowed yes, to respond to that? Um, I, I, I like that, that version of, of life um, uh, and would like to live in that world. I think, I think, it, I think this, this highlights a really important consideration in a lot of the conversation about the importance of community. You know, the, the U.S. Constitution does not have the federal social safety net in it. Um, and the reason why we created Social Security is because the elderly were dying in tenement houses. And the reason that we created food stamps is because children were starving to death in, in the United States, all throughout the South. There were major, major social problems uh, that were not being solved by community. And this was long before the IT revolution, and this was long before uh, globalization. Uh, uh, and this was, uh, you know, at least parts of parts of this story take place during what we, what many conversations about community look back on as the kind of golden age of of, of American social capital and, and civic life. Uh, so one of my concerns about uh, the conversation that that we're having about about community and, and local institutions is that it is um, it, it does not take seriously enough the massive failure of community and local institutions to to provide even the most basic level of support for members of that community in large parts of the United States over over relatively large periods of time yes sir <laughs> President. 
why not the community as the first pillar you did not consider because without community there is no state or no markets i thought community is the first pillar but at the same time what he said as a personal experience of homeowners association i don't know how to manage or motivate the individuals to build a better community it has been a problem from india to here i am working on potholes from village to what you talked about potholes in uh, chicago i have been working potholes of both in the road and in the minds of the people so what do you think is the most difficult aspect in building this kind of society whatever is assumed or agreed or suggested as mike was telling there are failures where community failed but the state helped i am trying to look at the same way like you know whether county is really helping my community or i am able to mobilize the communities because one day when i called for so many people nobody attended the meeting but i know what they want when i said there is a seminar on stock market everybody came in immediately but when i said about welfare about the community nobody turned in that means people are more materialistic still whatever values or society love and emotion or basic caring or human values you are saying i am not seeing them what is your solution for that and what is the most difficult problem you think in practice to motivate the people for building the better community okay thank you so i mean i i think the issue can can go both ways right i mean it is possible that if you didn't have a uh, sort of structures to pick up uh, homeless people on cold nights uh, if you weren't confident that the state would take care of it or the local municipality would take care of it um, neighbors would go out to see if uh, if there are homeless people around because we simply our humanity doesn't allow people to starve on the uh, to to freeze on the streets um at the same time uh can you rely on that and can you rely on the fact that uh, every community will have enough of those people and so what we do is we you know balancing one versus the other sometimes we might think maybe we make this a a function of the um of the state rather than uh, something we allow for private uh, volunteer action and uh i think michael's pointing to situations where you know the state had to step in uh of course and and there is evidence on this which is that as the state uh created social security for the elderly the elderly became less willing to support the young in the community because they had their own uh sort of support and so uh why do i care about how well the young do i mean these are all effects at the margin i i don't think it means that the elderly don't care at all about the young it just means they'll care a little less uh once this this happens because their future is taken care of they're not dependent on the young anymore i i think this is where it's all becomes a balancing act the the extremes don't work we need to do a little bit in this direction a little bit the ideological solution wants an extreme and the extreme simply you know for variety of reasons is not the right place to be we balance it out and we pick a point and and that's how how we create our societies so so my guess is we got to we got to find that balance again okay this is going to be our last question right here um sorry to cutting us off but we're over time already thanks for the uh the, the book and the conversation uh alan abramson from the policy school at george mason university the the bell that goes off for me when when i hear third pillar or third sector is the the nonprofit sector the, the ngo sector civil society call it different things and i heard that only very much in passing in your in your talk um is there more in the book or is there not is is the nonprofit sector philanthropy social capital uh robert putnam's work about uh the decline of social capital are those things do you wh wh where do those fit if at all in your uh analysis so i i I'm, i'm guilty of trying to keep the model sort of uh uh tractable tractable <laughs> uh three is about how many agents i can handle and most people would say the book is already long enough uh so uh it it, it does fall within the community it's volunteer Uh, volunteer social organizations of one kind or the other uh, or social groupings of one kind or the other so political parties you know might uh, to the extent they have a local component come into this um, you know um, volunteer organizations at the local level but even uh, a variety of components of civil society ngos this that would come into this 
am I being overly fuzzy? Guilty as charged. I am being fuzzy. Uh, and each one of these, when you detail them, may have slightly different responsibilities, slightly different functions. But, uh, you know, uh, who was it? Uh, Borges, who said, if you want a detailed map of the world, uh, it's as big as the world. <laughs> uh, and therefore, it's, it's useless. So I'm trying to be parsimonious. Therefore, I've, uh, I've stripped away some of the detail. We had a good conversation about, you know, where does the church belong? And I think the church is, was in many ways an important part of the community, in some communities less so. But you can see how it brings people together and therefore is, 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 an, is a part. And it regulates and checks uh, the market and the, and the state Absolutely. at the same time. So Absolutely. all of those things play and, a role. And I spend a lot of time in the book about the early role of the church, the, the Catholic church, but I, I don't spend that much time uh, later. But, but it's certainly a big part of the community. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. We really appreciate it. Please join me in thanking Dr. Radin. Um, there are some copies of his book available out there. And uh, if you go and get one, uh, he might even agree to sign those for you. Um, so um, please uh, help yourself to those. And thank you all so much for joining us. This has been a great conversation and very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you.